Hey guys, greetings. Mark Boswell, Boswell Emergency Medical, Education Technology. Um, still on the road today, heading home from that class in Springfield, and got done listening to some of my trauma lectures, uh, getting prepped for the uh, trauma cert exam on Tuesday I'm taking. Got a, another message from another Facebook follower about what to do as they had failed the exam. And this person had failed the exam not once, not twice, but three times. And I really, I really feel bad for that person. I mean, not, not, I don't pity them, but I mean, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm upset. I mean, it bothers me. I, I wish people would be successful. I wish I could all be successful, you know, but there are going to be a percentage of people that, that don't pass this test. Um, and so I started to enter some dialogue with this person by message. Um, maybe to help them out a little bit and I realized you know I get these questions I'm not gonna say a lot well I get them frequently uh, because people find my material out there <clears throat> they see a lot of it they use it and so obviously when they want to contact someone when they don't do well they a lot of times they look towards me I do not take this as a reflection on my material or my course not being adequate and I'm okay with that Matter of fact, some of these people haven't even seen my stuff, and I first thing I do with them, well, first thing when someone tells me they haven't passed, is I tell them, "Have you been using the material I have out there that's for free?" And if they haven't, I refer them to that. So I'm not I'm not so much worried that there's unsuccessful stories because people have used my stuff, and this person in question that just messaged me had actually used uh, the videos and had some of the resources also. But it got me thinking. How can I advise these people? Because there's a lot of things that are going to be similar that I'm going to say to everybody that contacts me when they don't pass. And just in the essence of saving time to have to individually message them, I figure I'd put it into a video that people that fall into that category of not being successful could get some information from. Because a lot of the things I'm going to tell each person are going to be universal to all of them. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so. So first and foremost, if you don't pass the exam, relax. Okay, it's not the end of the world. Now, even if your job is on the line, because I know there's some people that have to have this CE and certification for their job, still relax. This is not an unaccomplishable, I know that's not a word, it is not an unpassable exam. Okay, there's many reasons why people, well, there's probably only two or three big reasons why people don't pass this test, even after a time or two. First, I'm gonna reassure you, I'm gonna tell you when I had been in contact with the BCN a year or so ago and got some information from them about statistics, the initial information they gave me was that about 80% of people pass this on the first time. Okay, that, those numbers may have changed recently, but I can't, I can't, I don't think it's logical those numbers have changed dramatically in the last couple of years. All right, so about an 80% pass rate, meaning 80 out of 100 exam takers will pass first time. Now that's reassuring to people when they take the exam the first time, because hey, you're automatically going to be in that, you know, odds are being that 80% group, if nothing else. So there's going to be 20% plus or minus that don't pass it the first time. Here's your, here's your positive reinforcement or your positive message. Second time exam takers, they failed it once, they're taking it a second time. That rate of passing goes up to the mid to high 80s. Okay, so it already shows that if you stick with it, your odds go up. Now, some people have to take it a third time. Well, fortunately for them, if you stick it out and you just do decide to do it a third time, the passing rate for third time exam candidates goes up into the 90s. Now, let's consider that number. There's gonna be some people who fail the first time who are so upset angry, distressed, maybe even a financial situation because, hey, this exam costs money. Preparation costs money. I get that. Some of these people will be so upset they're never going to take this exam again. They're just like, I don't need it. I'm done with it. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm upset. I understand that. It's, we, we, we all hate failure. And unless there's some significant perceived benefit to something, why would you want to put yourself through that again? I understand that. So, of the people that take it a second time, I'm logic, making a logical assumption here that a large amount of them, that, I'm sorry, not a large amount, but some of those people 
that second time pass rate doesn't include people who said, hey, I'm not doing this again. People have to take it a second time. It's showing their commitment, their dedication, their purpose, their fortitude to get this done. And people who take it a second time, now they've seen how the exam works. They've seen the computer terminal. They've seen the process. They've seen the blank piece of paper. They've seen that, oh, I get to write stuff down. I get to make notes before and during the exam. They know these things now. So the exam experience, just of being in the cubicle in front of the computer, is not new to them. They're familiar with it. That already that already takes down a stress and anxiety level right there. It also takes down some distractions and allows you to focus on performing better on the exam. The same logic applies to the third time test takers, those that are in the 90% group, okay? Again, some people fail after two times and they are off the radar. They're like, I'm out, I ain't doing this again. So I assume again, if you're in that third, if you are repeated that exam three times, you're in the group that really wants or has to accomplish this. You're really committed, dedicated, and focused on trying to get this done. You're being, your, your perseverance is noted. You're not letting the previous failures sway you. You're sticking with it. Therefore, your odds are going to go higher that you're gonna pass this. And hey, if you've done nothing else to study or prepare for this, now you've sat in the test center twice before, you're more familiar with the environment, you're more familiar with how it goes. Heck, you've seen 300 practice questions because you've taken the exam twice, so you've seen two sets of 150 questions. Even though you failed them, you've seen them. You know what kind of things are asked about. You know the structure and the format. You know, are you going to, you know that you're not going to see some pictures. You know that things like the 12 lead AKG will just be described to you. Um, you'll understand that. You'll have a better feel for it. So hence, the third time test taker, much higher passing rate than the first or second time people. Yeah, you probably had to lay out more money for more study guides, more review material, took more of your time away from work, family, whatever. But again, your perseverance showed and your rate goes up. To this date, I've only had two people contact me saying they've, pat, they've failed it those three times. The one was a, a person today, and then there was a young lady uh, four, about three or four years ago out of Kentucky who was a flight nurse, and she was having a lot of struggles. I think she had taken it four times. So let's look at those people, and what can I say to those people to help them out? Well, first and foremost, make sure you've watched well, before I even say what to do, let me tell you what not to do. If you've been using my material exclusively or for a large part of your study review, I am not going to be pretentious and pretend or lie to you and say that I'm the best. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. Mine is the only thing you need. I'm not going to pretend that. Matter of fact, even if someone fails the exam after using my videos or book or going to a class just one time, in all honesty, I would like to recommend to them to look for an alternate source, another presenter, another method, I, you know, video versus audio versus class, another book, find something else and use that. Let my stuff sit to the side, okay? Because some people are only going to get so much learning or review or refreshment out of my material and admittedly, I can't pretend that I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. I'm not going to tell you all the little nuances and subtleties. And let's just face it, I may not be the presenter that works for you, for your style of learning, your mindset. I don't pretend that I'm the most likable guy out there. I'm sure there's things I say and do that people disagree with, and that impairs their learning. So even after a first time, I'd like for people to consider other sources because I want you to be successful. And yeah, that means giving your money to someone else when I could use it to help pay my bills and to help do the things I need to do professionally and personally. But your success, when it happens, is gonna be partly my success too, rather, you, rather even if you use me as your first resource or if you came to me after using other ones. I'm just happy to have been a part of it. I'm just happy that because I've been part of that, that you'll say good things, um, you'll recommend and refer me to your peers, you'll respect what I'm doing, um, things like that. So that makes me happy that I'm a part of it. So first and foremost, if all you've been doing is using my material, please, please, please go look at another source. Go look at another presenter, another class, some of their videos, some of their material. To, and that material may actually bring out little things that actually help you understand some of the stuff you heard from me or vice versa. 
so it can actually supplement each other, okay? I talked about, in a prior video that's on YouTube, about how to study, and that's just a general, like from the start. When you start considering this exam, how are you gonna study for it from start to finish? And I mentioned, and I walk you through several things about certain books, certain products that I, some I recommend, some I don't, some that are useful, some that are less useful. I'm gonna pull one thing out of that. If you have not, and this is for my repeat CE and fail people, if you have not yet gotten that big blue ENA CEN review book, it's blue, it's the fourth edition, it's the current one, fourth edition. You need to get that. Okay? And here's a couple reasons why. And I know it's I know it's pricey. Um, that's a different discussion. The ones that I sell, that I, that I resell as a wholesaler, I sell them on Amazon, I sell them on my website. I try and make sure that my price stays to be the lowest one for your benefit. Plus, if you order it from me, you're getting a stack of handouts and some other supplemental material that you won't get from other uh, retailers or other publishers. It's stuff because I actually order them, package them at my house, my apartment. I package them with supplemental material and handouts, and then I send them to Amazon to be shipped out. Okay, so order if you order it from me, that's what you get. This is why that's such a huge resource. Number one, it's written by the ENA, and 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 distributed or marketed through them. So right away, you're getting a credible source that is accurate as far as the CE and exam goes, okay? I'm gonna say they're the most credible source because they are part and parcel. I know that ENA and BCN are separate organizations now. However, there is still some continuity between the two that overlaps. Those in that big blue book, there's five practice exams of 150 questions each. Each practice exam is proportioned just like the actual CE exam. So there's, what, 18% neuro, 20% respiratory. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but they're proportioned exactly the same. So you're going to be exposed to the appropriate amount of questions from each section. All of those five exams in there, all the questions are different. So you are actually getting a database of five times 150 that's 750 practice questions and if eventually you work through all those you will have seen 750 CEN exam like questions okay so you get a sheer volume of questions also in that book is in the back of it there's a code and a web link that code is unique to that book and the purchaser you use that web link to go on to that website it directs you to and using that code, it opens up or unlocks two online practice exams that you can do at home on your computer. These two are completely different than the five that are in the book as far as questions. So there's another 300 questions you can be exposed to. The thing about these online tests that you get free with the purchase is that it helps you replicate the exact testing environment. In other words, for you to do the online practice test, it helps your body, your biomechanics, your your emotive, things like that. It starts to build memory pathways of you sitting in front of a computer, looking at a screen for up to three hours, that's the time limit, and having to use a keyboard and mouse to go through these questions, okay? So that starts to build some psychomotor retention with the information also. That's very useful for someone who's unfamiliar with a computer testing environment. So that's another benefit. Another benefit besides those two is the fact those questions are very underlying emphasis, very CEN-like. They're not the same ones that are on the actual exam, but a large majority of those questions, and I have this from good authority, a large majority of those questions are ones that were submitted to be potential exam questions but they were just not included in the database. They're not inaccurate questions. They're not out of date questions. They're not inappropriate. They're just ones that when the people that made the actual test sat down with all the questions that were submitted, they had to say, hey, which ones do we keep? Which ones do we not use? Okay, so there, these, the 750 in the book and the 300 online, they are all fair game. They could have been on the exam, okay? Also, Here's another benefit. 
those questions that were submitted for potential exam questions by exam item writers, some of their same questions became the actual exam. So the tone, the structure, the theme of the questions on the actual exam is going to be reflected in that workbook, that handbook, that study book, okay? Because again, they're the same caliber, it's the same people, the same exam writers who had written all these questions. Some wound up on the exam, others didn't, they put them in a study book, okay? How to use a study book. I get a lot of people who tell me they've used this book and I talk to them back and forth to find out how they used it to try and help them. Here's what I found. Not everybody uses that big blue book the way it was meant to be used, okay? If you do take the time, read the first couple pages in it, it tells you the suggested use for it. And I'll summarize it for you. Those five practice tests inside it, you're supposed to treat each one like a separate individual exam and go into it as such. In other words, you're gonna have the book in front of you at home. You need to sit down at your desk, your table, whatever, with the book in front of you and an answer sheet, okay? You need to clear your schedule, clear your time, clear your responsibilities, clear the distractions. You need to make this a quiet, dedicated, even though it's, you're doing it as a test, it's you're actually studying. You need to clear all those distractions. You're trying to replicate a testing environment as best you can. Now, it's kind of hard to do in some houses. I know you might have pets, you might have kids, but those really are the things you need to try and remove so you can sit down and do these practice questions or that the, one of the practice exams out of the book. You need to set a timer. Give yourself three hours. You need to replicate that time, just like on the real exam. You need to be aware and be able to look up at the timer and see how much time you have left. Okay, you need to replicate that tension and that stress and that pressure of having a clock running during the exam. You need to go through and do the entire exam without stopping to check your answers. Matter of fact, I would suggest you don't even check them right after. I suggest you wait till later in the day or the next day. Okay? You need to go through it and take it just like it's the regular test because I've heard of people using these questions. They just they just do each question. They try and answer it, then they go look it up. Answer it, look it up. Answer it, look it up. No, that's not what it's meant to do. It's meant to be taken as separate individual tests that afterwards you go and score. Do the same thing as you would on the computer test. In other words, if you get done early before the three hours, I want you to go back through your questions and answers and look at them. In one of my other videos, I talk about what you need to look for. I'll give you a brief summary. Number one, if you have time to go back through your questions and answers, I want you to quickly scan them. Do not change anything unless you can see there's a compelling reason to change that question, to change the answer you picked. You may have left some of the questions blank, okay? That's fine, because I'm gonna tell you, three hours, 150 questions, that's about a little more than a minute for each question. Okay, that is, a, that is a testing standard. When we as exam writers write an exam, that is a standard. You need to allot approximately a minute per question for your exam taker. So a 60, uh, uh, a 60 question exam, you need to give students about 60 to 75 minutes to complete that. Like if you're a college instructor or some type of faculty, okay? So three hours is definitely doable. Therefore, if you need to spend out a minute maybe a little more in a minute on each one, you need to keep that in mind. If you're sitting there looking at one question and you're dwelling over it, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes, you need to move on. Matter of fact, don't even wait that long. I'm gonna tell you, if you can't answer that question in about 30 seconds, and 30 seconds is a long time, okay? Because there's a lot of questions you're gonna answer in about five or 10 seconds. Okay, seems really fast, but that, that's, uh, 10 seconds is a long time to pick an answer, okay? If you're going on more than a minute or so for each one, you need to leave that one blank, and you need to come back to it. Why? Because later in the exam, you may see something or read something that clues you in or jogs your memory about one of those prior ones. I prefer leaving them blank, because that way I can go back through and see which ones I need to readdress, I need to look at again and try and answer. Some people will tell you, go ahead and put an answer in that one. At least so you don't forget to go back or run out of time and you don't even get the chance of 25% chance of getting that one right. 
I get that. If you do put an answer in on the ones you're unsure of, I want you on your scratch paper to write down that question number. So you may have a little list at the end, when you get to the end of you know several questions you need to go back and look at, okay? I've done that myself a time or two. Even though I put down an answer on the computer, I may have made a little note there like, you know, question 78. And then at the end of the exam, I'll go back and look at 78 again and make sure I feel really good about it, okay? So the whole thing with that blue book is make sure you're using it how it's meant to be used. Take one exam and then grade it. Try and replicate the exam experience. Grade it, see how you do. Based upon the scores from that, there's a way you can look at and determine which ones you're not, which sections you're not doing so hot in. That blue book is not meant to be a study tool. That blue book is meant to be an assessment tool to replicate assessing just like it was a real exam. So really the blue book is just one tool you should have. Based upon how you score your test, your practice test, then you identify your weak areas and you want to go to your other materials and start working through those weaker areas again, rereading, re-highlighting, taking notes, writing down. Remember, writing writing is an important part of making memory connections, of building knowledge. You write down facts, tables, and do it repetitively, okay? Don't write down all the little ifs, ands, ors, things like that. Writing is best done for things that are repetitive, lists, tables, facts, okay? Draw pictures when you can, when you're taking notes. Okay, those are useful. You've got a part of your learning that is driven by graphics and visual cues. Okay, that's how a lot of us remember, like for example, the rule of nines. We use a stick man or some type of drawing. That's how I teach people in class to answer the Brown Sequard question. They're going to draw a stick man and they're going to label on there where the different abnormalities are. That's how I teach EKGs. I want my students to practice drawing a four by three EKG printout and labeling each of the leads. Again, using those visual graphical cues, okay? So I'm kind of overlapping a bit about the study versus how to use that tool and all that, but I hope it's gonna help some people. You know, time frame. I know the ENA, the board says you have 90 days, you cannot retest within 90 days, and that's to ensure that you don't come right back in next week and bomb it again, and now you're practically suicidal or something. Those 90 days, personally, I think, I believe, and I feel, and I've heard, I recommend waiting at least three to four weeks before you even look at any material again. You've got to get over that hump. You've got to get over that, get over that sense of self-failure, things like that, okay? Because if you're still dragging that self-failure, this big pressure, this heavy weight of unsuccessfulness, it's gonna affect your studying, okay? So I say wait about three or four weeks before you even pick up a book again, all right? Now that's for the person that wants to do it right away at like 91 days, as soon as they can. Wait about three or four weeks, okay? Because um, you gotta get over it. If you don't, it's gonna be a mental block. You're always gonna, that's always gonna be nagging your mind, like what if I don't pass again, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some people also are just what we call bad exam takers. I talk about some actual logistical exam taking strategies in another video. Um, it's the one that's called um, things, I think it's called last minute things to do. You need to be aware of these things. You need to be aware of, you've got to get up once in a while during this test and clear your mind, especially if you find yourself plowing through it. You've got to pace yourself. You've got to know what your time is, how much time you have left, and where you are in the exam, okay? You've got to You've got to force yourself, even though you're sick and tired of it, if you're done early, you've got to force yourself to go back through it and look at things again and resist the urge to change things unless they are wrong, okay? Those are just a few of the things. Um, I mentioned a few other things about getting up and taking a break every 30, 45 minutes or so. Um, that helps with your long or short term memory, how they connect and put things more active that you can use them, because you've got to have that, because you're going to be so stressed out. The last thing I'd say to someone that's just having consistently hard problems with passing this test, it's usually not going to be a knowledge deficit. Huh, there's a nursing diagnosis. It's usually not a knowledge problem, not by the time you get through three exams. And usually the people that have taken three exams, they're very committed professionally and clinically. The long and short of it is, this is a modality that, you're, that we are assessing your cognitive knowledge by making you take information from here and using your psychomotor skills of putting it down on a computer or on a piece of paper. 
for some people that skill set is lacking or how do they they have an ineffective time of communicating the information from here to some written or visual or audible form for those people there's nothing unique about this exam about test anxiety or about test skills I need you to go online and Google and look for anything that talks about successful exam taking um, reducing test anxiety there's plenty of resources and articles out there there's uh, magazine articles there's essays there's editorials these are all standard ways to deal with poor test taking the skills it's nothing I'm gonna spend your time talking about because it's not unique to this exam not everybody has exam anxiety to the point of panic sweaty palms high heart rate blurred vision etc some people just have poor skills but we always say well i'm a bad test taker or i have test anxiety let's face it unless you're having to take a xanax before a test you don't have test anxiety like diagnosable you have the normal stress response of it's a big test it's important all the strategies and tips about how to successfully navigate a professional board exam they're the same whether it's the mcat the lsat the gre the cen or any other professional national authoritative exam is the same strategies those things are going to talk to you about how to eliminate the negative answer to to you know reduce your selections it's going to talk to you about looking for the two that are probably opposites like there's a large there's a big chance if one answer is hypokalemia and the other one is hyperkalemia there's a strong chance statistically your correct answer is one of those two okay not always but a okay, but more often than not things like that so I encourage you to look for those additional resources out there and use those. Um, I don't mind personally if you're just completely at your wits end and you've done the things I've talked about. You've watched not just my clinical videos, but also the ones about how to study. Uh, there's four or five of them, if I recall. You've done all that and you're still crazy panic mode. I don't mind. You want to message me. and you know, the, Probably the next thing I'm going to do is say, send me your test reports. I'll look at them and see if I can see some trends to help advise you on. But I don't pretend to have the magic bullet to help everybody pass. But I do want to encourage you to stick with it. Eventually, it can be accomplished. Eventually. Okay? Do not lose hope. I mean, if you've made it through two priors or three, three prior ones not passed, hey, look how far you've come. Your life hasn't ended. Okay? It can be done. It just takes looking at things a different way, hearing things differently, studying a little bit different things, and taking some time. Making sure your learning environment is correct as well, too. Make sure if, you know, if you, and I don't know the way to tell if someone's more of an auditory versus a visual learner or whatever, but there are tools online that can help determine that. <coughs> different strategies as well. You know, is, do you need to look for a product or a, a, some study material that's more visually orientated, oriented, with more graphical content for pictures and such? Um, do you need to be on something that um, is a, more drawn out over a longer period of time? Or do you need just the bullets kind of thing? Do you need to incorporate a lot of memory mnemonics? There's some examples of those in the back of my book, by the way. Or you can go to, I think it's medicalmnemonics.com. That's M E D. I C A L M N E O. Wait a minute. Whatever the spelling for the word medical mnemonics is, medicalmnemonics.com, they've got a whole list of things you can use that are good for people for those quick, uh, down and dirty little memory joggers. Okay. Um, there's actually a book out there. Um, I don't think I've actually reviewed it before, but it's called Emergency Medicine Pearls. I know it's a medical book, but a lot of the pearls, the little tidbits in there, the little things, the little things that you see the medical residents or the EM residents running around spouting off, just regurgitating um, ad hoc, these little things, these little statistics, these little bits of data, things like that, those are useful for some people. So you can look for that as well too. Um, I think that's all I got for that. Um, gosh, this video went longer than I wanted. Um, so it's about 30 minutes. I hope it's helpful to some people. I welcome your feedback. I'm going to put it both on Facebook, on my business page, as well as on YouTube so everybody can see it because I know not everybody follows my business page. Um, but feel free to post me any comments, feedback, suggestions. Um, if this works for you or if you think there's something else I can add in to help people, 
I'd love to hear it and try and incorporate it as well too, okay? So that's all I got for now. I'm wishing you guys the best. Um, just stay in touch. Keep following the page, the business page for sure, because I try and post stuff there pretty regularly. You know, I, I strive to out to outpost the others to keep you guys engaged with fresh information coming in, things to stimulate you, keep you coming back uh, for more, okay? All right, so y'all be safe. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, um, and uh, let me know how it goes, all right? Love to y'all. Peace out and be safe.